You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Corporate Report podcast. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorporateReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan here on the 18th day of October 2019. And you are tuned into episode 365 of the Corporate Report podcast, Lies, Damned Lies, and Government Nutrition Advice. Now, this will hardly come as breaking news to regular viewers of the Corbett Report, but I dare say even if you are part of the normie community who has never heard of an alternative media source, you will have noticed, if you have existed on this planet for any length of time, that every time you see a story, a breaking news headline in the mainstream media touting a new scientific study that says such and such piece of nutritional advice, it is a piece of hot, steaming, wet, smelly, often contradictory nonsense. Indulge this Valentine's Day. New research in the Journal of Nutrition found additional health benefits for dark chocolate. The flavonoids, naturally occurring plant compounds in chocolate, are an antioxidant and is now thought they may help protect against type 2 diabetes. Today's tip is to consider enjoying a glass of red wine. Red wine, along with other alcohol, can provide health benefits by increasing your HDL, or good cholesterol, and lowering your LDL, or bad cholesterol. Researchers at Johns Hopkins University failing to find any evidence that Reversitrol, the ingredient that's found in the skin of the grapes, of red grapes, and in chocolate, is linked to long life. A study just published in the Journal of the American Medical Association says eight cups a day can actually lower your risk for some cancers as well as heart and lung disease. And is coffee good or bad for you? Well, there's been a string of studies suggesting various health benefits from drinking it. Now the results of new research by the Mayo Clinic are adding a little bit of confusion. But we have known for years that reducing your intake of red meat may be good for your heart. Now it appears we know why. Researchers at the Cleveland Clinic released a new study just within the last 24 hours showing a new connection to red meat and potential heart risk. Cutting back on red and processed meat brings few, if any, health benefits according to a major evidence review that contradicts the dietary advice of leading international agencies. The new study, just published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, comes from a group of researchers who analyzed years' worth of data, mainly studies asking whether red meat or processed meats affect the risk of cardiovascular disease or cancer. Their controversial conclusions are now being met with fierce criticism. This study is fundamentally flawed in many, many ways. The authors picked and chose what kind of evidence they wanted to use uh, and used some of the most irrelevant evidence while ignoring some of the most powerful evidence. Confused yet? Good. You should be, because only an insane person could hold all of these contradictory pieces of nutritional advice and dietary guidelines in their head at any one time and make them cohere, because they do not cohere. You know what I'm talking about. This week, chocolate is good for you. Next week, it's bad for you. Red wine is good for you. Red wine is bad for you, etc., etc. And the aforementioned normies in the audience who somehow or other stumbled onto this podcast may interject to say, but James, clearly what is happening here is real science is being filtered through the mainstream media lens and packaged into into quick little sound bites that make a study uh, uh, that has real scientific validity to it and something to say into this little packaged headline that completely skews the point or misses the point or uh, misrepresents the point of the study. Well, not not necessarily so, in fact. Uh, you can and should, anytime you hear a mainstream media headline about new study says blah, 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 it is equally as lazy as what I recently pointed out on the uh, Propaganda Watch podcast about experts say, uh, it's a lazy journalistic cliche. A new study says da-da-da-da, and let's just report it verbatim uh, from the abstract, and that's the extent of our reporting on it, which of course does miss a lot of the, the nuance and detail. But still, even so, even so, as Corbett Report viewers will remember from earlier this year, it is not only possible, it happens quite frequently that 
Dishonest researchers, whether consciously manipulative researchers or ones that are just trying to find a significant result that they can report to pad their resume, will and can use all forms of statistical chicanery and other forms of chicanery in order to make certain dietary pronouncements, bold new nutritional pieces of advice, seem to have some full scientific validity when they do not. In 2015, a study from the Institute of Diet and Health with some surprising results launched a slew of clickbait articles with explosive headlines. Chocolate accelerates weight loss, insisted one such headline. Scientists say eating chocolate can help you lose weight, declared another. Lose 10% more weight by eating a chocolate bar every day. No joke, promised yet another. There was just one problem. This was a joke. The head researcher of the study, Johannes Bohannon, took to io9 in May of that year to reveal that his name was actually John Bohannon, the Institute of Diet and Health was in fact nothing more than a website, and the study showing the magical weight loss effects of chocolate consumption was bogus. The hoax was the brainchild of a German television reporter who wanted to demonstrate just how easy it is to turn bad science into the big headlines behind diet fads. Given how widely the study's surprising conclusion was publicized, from the pages of Build, Europe's largest newspaper, to the TV sets of viewers in Texas and Australia, that demonstration was remarkably successful. But although it's tempting to write this story off as a demonstration about gullible journalists and the scientific illiteracy of the press, the hoax serves as a window into a much larger, much more troubling story. What makes the chocolate weight loss study so revealing isn't that it was completely fake. It's that in an important sense, it wasn't fake. Bohannis really did conduct a weight loss study, and the data really does support the conclusion that subjects who ate chocolate on a low-carb diet lose weight faster than those on a non-chocolate diet. In fact, the chocolate dieters even had better cholesterol readings. The trick was all in how the data was interpreted and reported. As Bohannis explained in his post-hoax confession, Here's a dirty little science secret. If you measure a large number of things about a small number of people, you were almost guaranteed to get a statistically significant result. Our study included 18 different measurements – weight, cholesterol, sodium, blood protein levels, sleep quality, well-being, etc. – from 15 people. One subject was dropped. That study design is a recipe for false positives. You see, finding a statistically significant result sounds impressive and helps scientists to get their paper published in high-impact journals. But statistical significance is in fact easy to fake. If, like Bohannis, you use a small sample size and measure for 18 different variables, it's almost impossible not to find some statistically significant result. Scientists know this, and the process of sifting through data to find statistically significant, but ultimately meaningless results, is so common that it has its own name. P-hacking, or data dredging. As I hope you are aware, that is a short clip from The Crisis of Science, a podcast that I released earlier this year and which, as with all my podcasts, is available for free download. This one at CorbettReport.com slash Science Crisis. I hope you'll go there and check it out because I think it offers a pretty powerful retort to those who would say that the science underlying these nutritional studies is solid, good science. It's just the lazy journalists in the mainstream media who misunderstand or misrepresent that science. Well, I don't dispute that there are lazy journalists in the mainstream media who misunderstand and misrepresent scientific studies. Of course there are, but that does not exonerate the science, the scientists and the scientific studies themselves as if a, not only do scientists not make mistakes, which of course they do, but B, that they are never manipulative, deceptive, using techniques that they know will give them a significant result when there's really none to be had to try to detect a signal amongst the almost unimaginably vast noise of most dietary studies. I mean, it is hubris itself to believe that we can pinpoint exactly the effect of, you know, a glass of red wine per day amongst all of the other bajillion variables that are taking place in any one individual, let alone the tens or hundreds or however many people are participating in these studies and their self-reporting of what it is they're eating. I mean, there are so many ways in which even if every scientist was 100% on the level and doing their best to try to 
hone in on this particular ingredient in this particular one beverage and see what its effects are, even if they were doing their best to try to do that, it would be almost impossible. But of course, throw into that all of the other incentives that I outline in that Crisis of Science episode, and it becomes highly doubtful, shall we say, that you should live your life by the latest new study says, which I'm sure, again, I'm sure many of you have figured out by now, but it is important to underline this and to really think about the underlying point of what is happening here, how it is happening, and why it is happening. Because if you answer that question, a lot of the different threads of this tapestry begin to unravel and you get to start to see how the sausage is made, and how to avoid that sausage. <laughs> what an apt analogy. I just thought up on the spot. Well, there you go. So let's take a look at a very specific example of this from the broad array of nutritional advice and guidelines and dietary uh, uh, pontifications that we hear on a regular basis. Let's hone in on one specific case of this, which is sugar. And now this is something that I wrote about very specifically in the International Forecaster editorial almost two years ago. Of course, it is available as part of the Corbett Report subscriber newsletter. Please do subscribe and support the website if you appreciate this work. But back in December of 2017, I wrote The Sugar Conspiracy, which opens thusly. An explosive new study in the PLOS Biology Journal confirms three things that independent health researchers have been saying for years. One... Sugar-heavy diets are worse for your health than fat-heavy diets. Two, researchers have known this fact for decades. And three, the sugar industry actively covered up the research supporting this fact. The study, bearing the typically unwieldy title, Sugar Industry Sponsorship of Germ-Free Rodent Studies Linking Sucrose to Hyperlipidemia and Cancer, an Historical Analysis of Internal Documents, reads like an unlikely pairing of crime thriller and academic article. At the heart of this medical thriller lies the mysteriously named Project 259, a research study which ran from 1967 to 1971 to examine the link between sucrose consumption and coronary heart disease. From the outside, the project, headed by W.F.R. Pover at the University of Birmingham, appeared to be just another clinical study in nutritional science. It involved a feeding experiment in which lab rats were separated into two groups, one eating a high-sugar diet and the other eating a so-called basic PRM diet of cereal meals, soybean meals, white fish meal, and dried yeast. But this was not the passion project of an impartial scientist trying to get to the truth. This was a study sponsored by the Sugar Research Foundation, the SRF, which, in case you couldn't tell, has organizational ties to the Sugar Association, the trade association of the U.S. sugar industry. The results of the SRF's experiment according to an interim assessment issued in 1969, were extremely interesting. Quote, Among Project 259's observations was that the urine from rats on the basic diet contained an inhibitor of beta-glucarinidase activity in a quantity greater than that from sucrose-fed animals. This is one of the first demonstrations of a biological difference between sucrose and starch-fed rats. Having been a point of scientific inquiry and debate for decades, the first experimental evidence that sugar and starch are actually metabolized differently was significant enough. But as the PLOS biology article explains, the way in which this difference manifested was even more significant. Quote, This incidental finding of Project 259 demonstrated to SRF that sucrose versus starch consumption caused different metabolic effects and suggested that sucrose by stimulating urinary beta-glucarinidase, may have a role in the pathogenesis of bladder cancer. So, surely these results were published to much fanfare and became the touchstone for a thoroughgoing scientific inquiry into the possible sugar cancer link, right? Wrong. After supporting the project for 27 months, the Sugar Research Foundation did not approve the additional 12 weeks of funding needed to complete the study. Yes, exactly as you would have predicted, the breakthrough study demonstrating a biological difference between sucrose and starch-fed rats was shelved, and none of its results were ever published. But do you want to guess what was published? 
An article in the New England Journal of Medicine singling out fat and cholesterol as the dietary causes of heart disease and downplaying the risk of sugar consumption. That study, too, was sponsored by the SRF, but surprise, surprise, the sugar industry's role in funding the article was not disclosed when it was published in 1965. It took 51 years for that little factoid to be dug up by researchers and published. As I say, the fact that the sugar industry has been actively working to cover up sugar's role in coronary heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, and numerous other ailments will come as no surprise to my regular readers. And even the most fluoride-addled victims of the mainstream fake news will have heard something of this story by now. The New York Times, of all places, broached the subject in 2011 when it dared to ask, is sugar toxic? It was obediently followed by fellow MSM lapdog 60 Minutes asking the very same question the very next year. In 2015, Time magazine upped the ante considerably. Sugar is definitely toxic, a new study says. And by last year, the jig was up. As even the Huffington Post informed us, sugar is not only a drug, but a poison too. Okay, that's the end quote from that article. I hope you will actually read through the rest of that article. I think there's some important information contained therein. But this is not, obviously, as you can tell from the substance and flavor of that article, this is not just about sugar, although that is a prime example of what we're talking about. This is about the broader context of the scientific work that is deeming to tell us what we should and should not be putting in our bodies that, oh, by the way, just happens to be sponsored by the industry associations associated with those products. I wonder if there's a conflict of interest there. Yes, and we can prove that. It has been demonstrated in recent years that that was exactly the case when it came to sugar, which the uh, researchers found out decades ago is actually metabolized differently than starch and that is related to cancer but they kind of swept that under the rug for decades and decades and it is finally starting to come to light which in and of itself is a rebuke to those who would say that oh yes there may be a bad researcher here or there a bad apple that is working from non-pure scientific motives but that will be routed out yeah maybe it will be routed out after half a century generations have grown up under this false dietary regime and we see visibly see the result of that with the waistline of not only the average american but people around the world ballooning in that intervening time do you think there's a connection yeah yeah maybe there is and it is one of those facts that is difficult i i would hope for the average person out there to even wrap their head around that people would participate in a cover-up like this that they can visibly see is harming entire generations of people it's almost unbelievable, but there it is in black and white. And this speaks to that more fundamental underlying problem. It at least raises the question, how does this happen? How do these scientific myths get perpetuated and actually institutionalized in dietary guidelines and other such things for decades and decades, for half a century before finally coming under the light of scrutiny and being revealed? And the answer is actually remarkably simple and remarkably predictable. The answer, of course, is through government coercion. Move over food pyramid. There's a new symbol to get Americans to eat right. Uh, senior medical correspondent Elizabeth Cohen is here. So, Elizabeth, the pyramid is no more. Right. This pyramid is going to be disappearing. That's why we said RIP. It's been around for almost 20 years. And ta-da... What we're going to have now is a dinner plate. Now, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, Carol, because it hasn't been officially unveiled yet. But CNN has gotten word that the plate will be divided so that you'll see that half of what you eat every day is supposed to be fruits and veggies, smaller portions of a protein and a grain, and then a little bit of dairy off to the side. And they're really hoping that this icon sticks in people's heads better than the pyramid did. Life. I know, I was just going to ask you, what was so wrong with the pyramid anyway? <laughs> well, you know, take a look at it. It's, it's not exactly the finest public health message this country has ever generated. I'll just put it that way. First of all, the stuff you're not supposed to eat is at the top, and that's sweets and fats. And usually we think of the top as the best. 
So it's counterintuitive. And also, Carol, you can see there's this heavy emphasis on breads and grains. That's at the bottom, the, the biggest portion. And then fruits and vegetables are smaller than grains, which doesn't really make any sense since experts, you know, nutritionists say you're supposed to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. So it just, it didn't convey the message very well. You didn't just look at it and go, oh, now I get what I'm supposed to do. Ah, yes, the good old food pyramid. I trust that if you're of a certain age, you will remember the food pyramid from your school days. Heck, I was Canadian, and I remember the Canadian government had some equivalent of the USDA food pyramid that was pumped into our heads at that time with the four food groups and all of that. I remember that from my childhood days, but you may be surprised to learn, as I was quite recently, that, yes, that's gone the way of the dodo. There is no food pyramid anymore. That's been replaced, and in fact, you can get more details from choosemyplate.gov. Yes, there is a site called choosemyplate.gov that's brought to you by the U.S. Department of Agriculture that has a brief history of USDA food guides from which you can see some of the 1910s to 1930s guides like Food for Young Children and How to Select Food to the 1940s, A Guide to Good Eating to the 1950s and 60s, Food for Fitness, A Daily Food Guide, the 1970s, Hassle-Free Daily Food Guide, 1980s, The Food Wheel, which in 1992 officially became the Food Guide Pyramid, which in 2005 was replaced by the My Pyramid Food Guidance System, and 2011 was usurped by My Plate, which, yes, as CNN helpfully informed its viewers several years ago, now consists of fruits and grains, vegetables, protein, a little bit of dairy on the side. There you go, guys. This is what to eat, as brought to you by the truthy truth-tellers in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, with the imprimatur of the U.S. government behind it. What could go wrong? But actually, an interesting thing happens when you actually delve into some of these nutritional guidelines and dietary advice from the U.S. government and actually look at the specific advice and wording and the way it's changed over the decades. The first official dietary guidelines for Americans were issued in 1980 and have been updated every five years since. Let's see how they've evolved over time. Originally, they recommended to maintain an ideal weight. They soon realized this was a bit of an overreach, so they switched it to, mm, okay, at least maintain a desirable weight. As Americans got fatter and fatter, that became fine. How about just maintain a healthy weight? By the 1990s, they just apparently gave up and advised Americans to at least, fine, improve their weight. Or at least aim for a healthy weight? And by 2005, apparently the best we can do is just try to manage it. Let's go back. Avoid too much sugar. Good for them. Started out strong. But that's avoidance language. Can't have that. So instead, use sugar. Don't avoid sugar. Use sugar, but only in moderation. But only in moderation? Anti-American. So that became choose a diet moderate in sugar, as if we should go out of our way to make sure our diet has at least a moderate amount of sugar in it. Who doesn't want to appear moderate? Then they changed into a verb, choose beverages and foods to moderate your intake of sugars. Sounds a little negative, and by 2005 there wasn't any sugar-specific guideline at all. They went from avoid sugar to eh, Basically the same with many of the others. Avoid too much sodium. Ended up, choose and prepare foods with less salt. Choose especially whole grains to choose carbohydrates wisely for good health. That's a guideline? The whole point of the guidelines is to give guidance. That's like you know asking your mechanic what's the best way to maintain your car, and them saying, hmm, wisely. Avoid too much fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol. Started out pretty straightforward, but maybe a little too negative sounding to the meat, dairy, egg, and junk food industries, and so they changed it from avoidance to affirmation. Right? Choose a diet, low in saturated fat and cholesterol. Of course, even that was too bold, and so again left with the cryptic, choose fats wisely for good health. As the American public 
has gotten fatter and sicker, you'd think the recommendations would get more stringent, more emphatic. Instead, there appeared to be more emphasis on the industry's bottom line, and less on America's waistline or lifeline. What an interesting thing to do, simply to look at the advice that has been offered to different generations, and then to see the results of that advice, which we can, again, see with our own eyes in our daily activities, the ballooning waistline of people around the world, based largely on the changing diets and nutritional guidelines that people are encouraged to follow. And that is an interesting point, precisely because it does fly in the face of those who would inevitably go towards the first fallback in explaining how, how it is that nutritional science has gotten it so wrong for so long and led people down such blind alleys for so many years, giving them false tales about dietary cholesterol equals the cholesterol in your bloodstream, and fat is good, bad for you, and, and sugar is a good replacement, and all of this other nonsense that has literally made people fatter and sicker over the decades. How did that happen? Oh, it's just incompetence. Oh, it was lazy journalists and scientists that didn't know what they were doing. But don't worry, guys, we're getting it on track and everything's much better now. No, this is a rebuke to that because you can see demonstrated in the guidelines of something like the USDA and its brother and sister agencies in various governments around the world that the entire process of deciding what choose my plate, please, government, choose my plate.gov is being left to the hands of the revolving door at the top, which we know is populated by the corporations. I've talked about this in many different aspects, in many different ways over the years, and this is just another very interesting and very, well, sickening, literally, example of how this is done. The fact that the stick of government coercion is always wielded by the big corporations that use government as their own personal piggy bank. And here, here is the perfect example of that. In fact, if you want to hone in on the very specific example, once again, the sugar conspiracy is a great way of putting this into perspective. This is a disaster. An absolute unmitigated disaster. The fat's going down, the sugar's going up, and we're all getting sick. Now let me show you why. Okay. How'd this happen? Why did it happen? So this is where the politics comes in. This is the perfect storm, and it was created from three political winds that swirled around all at the same time to create this perfect storm. So the first political wind, everything bad that ever happened in this country started with one man. Okay? And it's still being felt today. Okay? So Richard Nixon, in his paranoia back in 1972, okay, food prices were going up and down and up and down. I'm going to show you that on the next slide. Okay? And he was worried that this was actually going to cost him the election. So he admonished his Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Rusty Butts, I love that name, okay, to f basically take food off the political table to make food a non-issue in presidential elections. Well, the only way to do that was to make food cheap. So he was out to find all methods to be able to decrease the price of food. Remember Nixon's war on poverty? This, it, we're suffering from it today. Okay? That's what this is. Okay? Second political win, the advent of high fructose corn syrup. Okay? So this was invented in 1966 at Saga Medical School in Japan by a guy named Takasaki, who's still alive. Okay? As far as I'm concerned, this stuff is Japan's revenge for World War II. <laughs> Except, of course, that they're suffering from it now themselves. Okay? Like everything, you know, it always comes back to haunt you. Okay? And it was introduced to the American market in 1975. So what do you think happened to the price of sugar when this thing hit the market? Here's what happened. So here's the US producer price index of sugar going up and down and up and down. Okay? This is not good. Okay? Um, stability is at 100%. If it stays nice and stable at 100%, that's what you want okay? if you're a politician. Up and down. Here's where corn sweeteners entered the market 1975, 1980. And you can see that since then, the price of sugar has remained remarkably constant. 
and it did so not just in the US, but also on the international stage. Here's the London price doing the same thing. And when you look at the difference in price between uh, sugar and high fructose corn syrup, you can see that high fructose corn syrup is about half the price. Okay? So in other words, it's cheap. So high fructose corn syrup is evil, but it's not evil because it's metabolically evil. It's evil because it's economically evil, because it's so cheap that it's found its way into everything. It's found its way into hamburger buns, pretzels, barbecue sauce and ketchup, okay? almost everything. Okay? Somebody um, emailed me the other day and told me they went into their local grocery store and went through every single loaf of bread on the shelf. And out of 32 low, you know, types of bread on the shelf, only one of them did not have high fructose corn syrup in it. Okay? So we are being poisoned by this stuff, and it's been added surreptitiously to all of our food, every processed food. Okay? And the question is, why? Well, you'll see why in a minute. Okay? So the corn refiners like to point out, well, you know, it's just been a substitution. Okay? As the high fructose corn syrup's gone up, the sugar's gone down. You know, we're just replacing, you know, like gram for gram. Well, not exactly, because here's 73 pounds of sugar per year. This is from the Economic Research Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, okay? So disappearance data, okay? 73 pounds up to 95 pounds by, two, by 2000, okay? And there's something missing from this slide. Anybody want to tell me what it is? What's missing? Juice. Juice is missing, because juice is sucrose, right? Sugar. And juice causes obesity. Okay? So this is a study done by Miles Faith, a prospective study in inner city Harlem toddlers. Okay? And the number of juice servings per day predicts the change in BMI score per month in these inner city Harlem toddlers. Now, where do these inner city Harlem toddlers get their juice? From what? From where? From whom? From WIC. Anybody heard of WIC? You know what WIC is? Women, infants, children, right? A government entitlement program set up under who? Nixon, okay, to prevent failure to thrive. They did. This is the equal and opposite reaction. So let's add juice in. Here it is. And so most fructose items, when you put it together, now we're up to 113 pounds on this graph. And I just heard from Brian Williams of NBC News after the uh, most recent uh, study came out uh, that was in the Journal of Clinical Investigation that we were actually up to 141 pounds of sugar per year, each of us. That's what we're up to, 141 pounds of sugar per year. Okay. Now, do you think that this might have some detrimental effects on you? Hasn't stopped you, has it? That's the point. It hasn't stopped you. That's why we need to talk about this. Now that, as some in the audience may be aware, is that rarest of breeds, a viral 90-minute nutritional science lecture. I mean, that doesn't come along every day, so it's notable perhaps in and of itself just for that. But that is called Sugar, the Bitter Truth, or at least that's the title that it's been posted on. Uh, posted under on GooTube, and it is a lecture by Dr. Robert Lustig, who has drawn on the pioneering work of John Yudkin, which is a name that probably will not resonate with almost anyone in the audience, because he was writing about all of the things that people like Lustig and others are now rediscovering decades later. He was writing about this in the 1970s, specifically in 1972, he wrote a book called Pure, White, and Deadly, How Sugar is Killing Us and What We Can Do to Stop It, which Lustig says in that lecture, he says, it was amazing when I found this book. And wow, lo and behold, all of the things I was finding in my research, Yudkin already had this. And he was pointing the way everything he said has come to pass. Unfortunately for the human species, because he was talking about the inevitable health decline that would accompany the rise of the consumption of sugar, which continues to rise and rise, so that people are now eating their body weight in sugar every year, whether they are aware of it or not. Probably people are not just dumping sugar on everything they're eating, but it is in everything they are eating. Everything that you are eating, unless you are exceptionally careful and eating only whole, unprocessed foods that you yourself 
to have a large part in the preparation of, you are probably consuming a lot of sugar. And uh, you won't even realize it because it has been infused into everything. Or not even sugar, but high fructose corn syrup and other things that uh, Lustig was warning about in that lecture. And as John Yudkin put it in his 1972 book, quote, if only a small fraction of what is already known about the effects of sugar were, were to be revealed in relation to any other material used as a food additive, that material would promptly be banned. And that was three decades four decades ago. I mean, it's just absolute insanity. But it does raise the question, banned? By whom? Who has the authority to do that? And the exact obverse of that, well, if somebody has the ability to ban this or that substance, then they have the ability to mandate it, or at the very least, insert it into nutritional guidelines so that it becomes institutionalized and forced on generations of school children who dutifully learn about the four food groups and how much of what to have every day or whatever indoctrination they get that they don't even realize how deep down into their subconscious that goes until they one day realize, oh, the food pyramid that I grew up with has been replaced and now there's choosemyplate.gov. What's going on? Um, that, now, this goes back to, again, the point of this and the underlying creepiness of this goes back to that corporate government amalgamation that I talked about earlier and that I've talked about in many different aspects here on the Corporate Report podcast, perhaps most notably back in episode 227 on the regulation trap, and in film literature and the New World Order number 35 on Upton Sinclair's The Jungle about the founding of the FDA and the fact that there was heavy corporate influence in the foundation of that particular governmental monopoly. And unfortunately, the entire history of U.S. government involvement in what people are eating is no exception to those those rules. And we can find more details on this, uh, quite specifically from a pamphlet uh, by Josh Souter called A Brief History of Food, Nutrition, and Government Policy in America that is available for free up online. Uh, it's not a voluminous read, uh, and I suggest you do read it because it goes into the specific details of this story from the early part of the 20th century right up till today in a lot of detail, and it's worth reading. Just reading from the opening of that particular treatise, it says, Government intrusion is often obvious. We know when government taxes our income, stops us from using our drug of choice, or when they kick down our door and throw us in a cage. But sometimes, government actions are more subtle and confusing. It's often tempting to blame industry alone for the failures in the market and to ignore the substantial, but often less visible role that government plays in regulating different markets. From the housing crisis and its relationship to banking, to healthcare and sky-high costs, this tends to ring true. When it comes to food, nutrition, and its impact on health, blame is often allocated against the market by the uninformed individual. The average person tends to vaguely understand the issue. They probably know a bit about farm subsidies, taxes, and the food pyramid. However, they most likely don't understand the level at which government regulates our food. There is a long and storied history of government agriculture policy, import tariffs, food quotas, shoddy science guidelines, and regulation, all of which gets passed over for more obvious scapegoats, such as the market and corporations, end quote. Now, I think that passage brings in the subject, although... I would stress and emphasize for all, anyone on the left who's horrified to hear it's government to blame and not the corporations. No, it's, they're equally to blame. The corporations and the government work together at that level. I think that's an important part of this. It is a fascist matrix. It's the wedding of corporate and government power in a monopoly power, um, the government, which has the monopoly stick that it wields to unfortunately great effect. Now, let's... Skip through, as I say, this is a, a big pamphlet that goes right through the 20th century and all of the various incarnations of U.S. dietary and guidelines and food tariffs and agricultural acts and other things. But let's skip ahead to the food pyramid, and we'll read from the section specifically dealing with that. Uh, Suda writes, quote, In 1991, Secretary of Agriculture Edward Madigan announced that the nearly complete federal food guide pyramid would be postponed though his official reason was that the pyramid would be confusing to children, it seems far more likely that he was responding to political pressure of groups like the National Cattlemen's Association, who had been vocal about the placement of the beef and meat food group in the pyramid. 
The pyramid had been in development for nearly 10 years under the supervision of nutrition professor Louise Light. Light had been tasked with updating the government's Basic 4 food guide, which had been released in 1956 as a replacement for the Basic 7. The goal was to create something that went much further than basic food recommendations. Light and her team of nutritionists aimed to remove foods that they saw as unhealthy. Her guide kept sugar below 10% of daily calories and limited refined carbohydrates and kept grains at a maximum of 2-3 to three servings per day, preferably in whole grain form. Light and her team encouraged 5-9 to nine servings of fruit and veggies and recommended quality proteins like eggs and nuts. Good fat sources like olive oil and flaxseed were also encouraged. Generally satisfied with their well-researched guidelines, Light and her team submitted the pyramid for review. Unfortunately, her guide was rejected and swapped out with dramatically altered guidelines to the point one, that one might be justified in wondering why they even bothered to hire someone to create such a guide, only to almost completely ignore it. Denise Minger shed some light on the changes to the pyramid in Death by Food Pyramid. The guide Light and her team worked so hard to assemble came back a mangled, lopsided perversion of its former self. The recommended grain servings had nearly quadrupled, exploding to form America's dietary centerpiece. Six to eleven servings of grains per day replaced Light's recommended two to three, and rather than aggressively lowering sugar consumption as Light's team strived to do, the new guidelines told Americans to choose a diet moderate in sugar, with no explanation of what that hazy phrase actually meant. Light was shocked and horrified by the changes. Despite her best attempts, she wasn't able to get her version of the pyramid approved. She was never given any justification for why the guidelines were changed, other than being told that healthy food was too expensive and that people on food stamps couldn't afford it. The USDA largely recognized grains to be interchangeable with fruit and vegetables from a nutritional perspective and didn't see any significant problems with their version of the pyramid. Light went on to write a book about the whole ordeal in 2006. Ultimately, the pyramid was released in 1992 and no significant changes were made in between the time that Madigan postponed the pyramid and the time that he finally approved it. However, significant amounts of money and time were spent attempting to improve the project anyway. There, on, there only were a few co cosmetic changes, sh such as the style of noodles in the picture were altered along with the color of the chopsticks. The food pyramid was thus approved and published in multiple educational texts and posters. It was slapped on cereal boxes nationwide and often marketed towards children with a nice government endorsement for cereal grains. We'll end the quote there. As I say, this is a a very in-depth pamphlet, so I will put the link in the show notes, and I do encourage you to read through it. It has many, many more specific examples throughout the past century of U.S. government interference in the daily eating habits of the average American. But talking about this entire subject and the, its deeper implications, uh, Josh Souter appeared on IITV a couple of years ago. So when I was a kid, they showed me the pyramid of what you're supposed to eat, you know, grains and meats and vegetables, with sugar on top and wheat down below. Of course, as an Italian, you had to flip that around. I just had more sugar. But where did this come from? Why do we even have it? Josh Souter wrote an interesting paper for the Foundation for Economic uh, Education, great organization. Why were you curious in the history of the food pyramid? So I feel like this is very misrepresented by most people. Most people don't really understand what has gone into this and they like to blame corporations, which certainly aren't innocent, but the government plays a very large role in this. I mean, this. That the government was a tool of big corporations to get you to eat the products that big corpor corporations want you to eat. That's part of it, yeah. I mean, lobbyists essentially- Any truth to that? Say again? Any truth to that? Yeah, there's some truth to that. I mean, lobbyists play a large role in government in general, uh, but especially in the food industry. There's uh, you could go back to companies like Arthur, Archer Daniels Midland. Uh, Dwayne Andreas was one of the most well-connected lobbyists in probably the history of America. He funded both sides of the aisle for years and years. Um, he eventually got, he was involved in a large price-fixing scheme with his company. Uh, his son actually went to jail. Uh, the movie The Informant starring Matt Damon is about, actually about his company and the massive amount of corruption that they went through. But um, So when, when, when did the pyramid start? I, I remember it as a kid. When was it created? So that, there's a lot going on there. Um, so basically, the McGovern Commission was sort of the predecessor to the food pyramid. So that was Senator George McGovern. He got involved in that in the early 70s, and then they released their, their findings in 79. So sometime around that, 
They started with the creation of the pyramid. They that, being the FDA? FDA was not so much involved. This was more USDA and the Department okay. of Health, and eventually it became just the USDA. Okay. Um, so a lot of it was based off McGovern's work, which was based off a scientist named Ansel Keys, who did a whole bunch of studies. Uh, he did his famous seven country study and the six country analysis. Um, so he did those, which led to McGovern. McGovern did all of his research, and then the USDA started creating the, the food pyramid. They wanted something fun and simple that they could sell. I don't know if they were aiming at children, but that's certainly what ended up happening. Um, so the actual pyramid came out in 91. Um, 91? Yeah, it took them a long time to actually finish it. Then what did I see when I was a kid? I could have sworn I saw the food pyramid as a grade, grade school kid. You're, you're probably, in the 70s. my guess would be looking at the, I believe it was the famous four or the, 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 the four or the seven, I forget the term, but they had the, um, the food, the four food groups, that's what right. it was, yes. in the 1950s, yes. and then that was later changed to seven, or actually reverse that, seven, then four. All right, so let me ask you, when they made this pyramid, did they get it right? And isn't that, isn't that a completely subjective thing? I mean, the idea that the government will know what the right diet is when everybody has different opinions on it, how do you even judge if they got it right? So that's kind of the time old question. Uh, nutrition is one of the most subjective in the sense that everyone is looking at different research. You know, you got your vegans, you got your paleo, keto, they all have dramatically different uh, views on it. And a lot of them are looking at the same science that has been interpreted differently. So overall, I would say no, the government did not get it right. They got it probably about as wrong as they could have. Um, but there still are a lot of things that are still being debated even now. Once again, Josh Souter discussing his attempts to document the history of food, nutrition, and government policy in America. Now, I suppose we've reached the point of the podcast where it may be a question in the minds of some of the listeners. Well then, James, what should we be eating? Or what shouldn't we be eating? Or there may be, I'm sure there are many people in the audience who are more than eager to tell us all what you have to eat or what you cannot eat or things along those lines. And if that is the point at which we've arrived, then I have signally failed in my duties as a podcast host today because the point of today's episode is not to give you specific nutritional guidelines or to warn you against this or that in particular, although I'm sure you can go into the show notes and look at some of the various things that I've linked and come to some of your own conclusions about these, but that is the point to come to some of your own conclusions after having done some research on some of these issues and research more than simply relying on choosemyplate.gov. Please, government master, tell me what I should be eating. Uh, the whole point of this is that when we forsake our own responsibility to ourselves and to our family to do basic research and basic due diligence about what it is that we should or should not be putting in our bodies to reach our own goals, because everyone has different goals and some people were willing to sacrifice this in order to gain that. The point is, when we forsake that and we put it into some central planning administrative body, that trough of power will immediately be monopolized by people who are looking to make their riches from using that trough of power. That is government. That is exactly what it is. That is exactly what it does. That is exactly what it is intended to do. And it will, that stick will always and forever, as long as it exists, be wielded to corral people where certain people want the population to go. And that is is really the point of this episode, and that's something to ponder the next time you are encountered, you encounter the food pyramid? No, the food plate? No, well, whatever they come up with next, whatever nutritional guidelines and advice, or the next time you hear a breaking news headline about a new study says that this food that you eat every day is killing you, or this food that you really want to eat every day, but you've been starving yourself of, well, that actually is great for you, or whatever they do to flip the, everything you've ever been told on its head tomorrow. Perhaps you can do a little bit more due diligence and research for yourself before simply taking any of this advice at face value, and that will go some way towards breaking the staff that enables such things as the sugar conspiracy to be conjured into existence. Well, that's going to do it for today. I will really suggest you check out the show notes to go more in-depth on the various uh, documents and videos and other things that I've cited in today's episode. And I'm sure there's a lot of 
comments to be had. So please go to corporatereport.com and leave your comments on today's episode. I'm looking forward to reading them and I'm looking forward to talking to you again in the near future. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.